bit fast. Good morning, hello, and how are you? And welcome to 2023. Oh, oh what you can see of it. There we go. There we are. So let's get the the blower set. One thing I'm very, very pleased about this year is the degree to which I've prepared for the winter because we've got a um, house that uh, a few years ago we had two wood burners in installed and that's um, only because we had an open fireplace in the lounge and so uh, there's a radiator in there as well but there was an open fireplace and because we've got a, a small packet of land we planted some trees on there planted about 100 ash trees and about uh, a dozen uh, evergreens uh, mainly uh, cause we, we you know we like thought we'd grow christmas trees and now they're all 200 feet high so we've got some scots pine and uh, <laughs> some norwegian spruce which actually I must cut down now, come to think of it, before they get to be 300 feet high. So, uh, oh, we're going to see the lake. We're going, we're going down what they, it's soon to be renamed the Lake Road, because uh, we've had so much rain lately, and it doesn't drain away here for some reason. It always used to, but it doesn't anymore. But um, yeah, so. Uh, we're talking about the preparedness you know so uh, so first of all I bought a house with a bit of land that's the first bit of preparedness then uh, we uh, got wood burners installed and I um, planted uh, all this tree all these trees and trees are a funny thing because you think uh, when you plant trees that you're you're going to be short of wood and, it, and obviously you do plant trees because you are short of wood but then uh, 15 20 years down the line you get to the point where you've got more more than enough wood you know it's like when we got chickens we thought we get some chickens how many should we get and we thought well we'll we'll eat a, we eat a lot of eggs you know we have scrambled eggs for breakfast every morning and uh, we uh, here it is here it is can you see that anyway I've got some I've got some better uh, footage of um, This from yesterday, which I might cut in. So uh, yeah, so then we planted the trees, and then we got the wood burners put in, and then really, you know, apart from the odd year when it was snowy, like in, in February, March, what so, sometimes even April, um, they, we didn't really think much of it, and then of course uh, now. Uh, Heating oil, home heating oils have gone up, and uh, electricity's gone up because they're, they're the only two ways that we heat the place. Um, and now we're sitting happy on a big stock of wood and uh, some, uh, and, and not really using the uh, central heating much, which is good. <coughs> and I think the uh, the burner that we've got in the kitchen, which is the main one is uh, 25 kilowatts now you can imagine what a 25 kilowatt that's 25 one bar fires in addition to every human being that's in the house which is who also gives off a kilowatt heat one kilowatt hour so all in all very happy to be where we are i dropped in this place yesterday because they've got some buckets on the left here you'll see they've got some buckets and they've always got a few broken ones which if you've seen the uh, technique that the bloke uses to move them around you'll understand why they're broken on the bonfire there and I can use those to um, store my wood nice nice merge So 
So, still on the theme of preparedness then. So, the other thing is that um, I think if you've got, you know, if you want to live off the wood, then you've got to be able to um, get it converted from a tree to the size of lump that will go on your fire. And so that involves uh, obviously various stages, not that many actually, but um, what you have to do is you have to cut it down uh, and pretty much flush with the ground, which is an annoying. I mean, if you're, if you're keeping the tree and you've got something like ash, and then you cut it off above the ground, then it will uh, grow again. And so uh, you'll, you'll get a pretty much um, everlasting supply of, of wood. If you are, uh, you, don't, you don't want the tree anymore, then you can cut it off flush with the ground. And you have to cut it off flush with the ground because eventually you're gonna to wanna to mow over the top of it until such time as the trunk sort of dissolves, which you will do if it can't ever grow again. And, um, and you don't want to keep bumping into it with the lawnmower. And you have to have it flushed because you can't like, leave it three inches sticking up because uh, the grass will grow up lo longer than that and so you'll just drive straight into it. You won't even see it. So, you, so wherever you're driving will just go, you'll, you'll plow straight into it at full speed and that will bend something. And I actually wrote off a Renault 5 driving around the field because I hit a tree stump that was hidden in grass because it hadn't been cut down low enough. So you either have to leave them up high, like two foot or 18 inches or something, so you can see them, or uh, or cut them off down low. Now the problem with cutting them off really, really low is that you get the uh, chainsaw then gets in contact with the earth, and even if it's mud, uh, you might think to yourself, well, what you know, what's the worst that can do? But the action, the fact is, it can do quite a lot quite quickly. So there's nothing worse for knackering a chainsaw than cutting trees off uh, the stumps. The, uh, there's not much point uh, sharpening chainsaws. I know you can sharpen a chainsaw, um, and there are ways of doing it, but to be honest, for the 20 quid or something it costs to buy a new chain, I used to try and get through a whole year with one chain and sharpen it, but now I buy two or three chains at the beginning of the year. And if the chain goes off, then you have to just, uh, you, you might perhaps sharpen it once, but uh, then, and then sling it out. Because your productivity, you're far better off cutting wood and spending 20 quid than um, you are, um, sharpening chainsaws you know it could take you an hour to sharpen a chainsaw and you can cut a lot of wood in an hour plus it's a bit of a knack you know you have to sort of practice getting it right and then you can spend an hour sharpening it and then try and cut through some wood and then realize that uh, you're not you know you still not really improve things much you wouldn't shoot. I've got a new uh, steering wheel cover which my wife gave me for Christmas although I bought it for myself and I gave it to her to give to me for Christmas you see that's the way to get presents that you always want but um, in the old days they used to be leather and they used to be laced up on the inside with like a shoelace and they were lovely but these ones are basically like a child's inner tube not an inner tube, but a, a tyre, you know, an outer a tyre. <coughs> With a sort of a plastic and nylon cloth cover. And so you, you might, oh, actually you'd be better off just going into a, <laughs> it's an old car, go into a, just a, a bicycle shop and buying yourself like a 34, 36 inch cycle tyre and putting it on probably not quite as fancy so we are um, I mean my day today is really busy I've got I've only got half an hour for lunch today because it's it's gone mental and then you, you need to get you need to prepare for the day that um, uh, for when you're coming back. Let me just finish on, on the wood analogy. I'll just very quickly finish. 
So you're going to get yourself a, an axe and then you're going to get yourself a splitting axe and then you're going to get a logging saw and uh, then you're going to realise that none of that, none of that is what you want. If you're going to survive, what you need is a, a, a petrol powered chainsaw. It doesn't need to be that big, but it does need to be petrol powered. And, and a decent make, like a Husqvarna or a steel or something. Not a, not a something out of B&Q. Some Japanese make, uh, some, some, you know, sort of a South Korean something or Chinese mainly. And um, secondly, when you've uh, cut your tree down and sort of chopped it up into logs, you're going to need to split the logs. Now, if you do what I've done with the ash trees, um, I grow them fairly close together because that encourages them to grow tall rather than sideways. And I prune them regularly so they don't really get much of a chance to grow sideways. And then when they're about 30 feet tall and I can't get my hands around them, you know, you put your hands around them. When you can't get your hands around them, then you know that that's time to cut them down. Um, then they're easy to cut. And in fact, they're already log size. So what you can do is you can quite easily uh, chop them down without worrying about killing yourself if one, uh, you know, if you do it wrong. And um, uh, then you need some sort of saw bench and uh, just uh, chop them all up. So, Then you need a last thing you need, and sometimes the most useful things you buy last uh, because they're a bit expensive. And you think, "Oh, I can manage without those." And then you realise when you've got them that that's what you really needed all along. And that is um, a log splitter, hydraulic log splitter. And I've got a little one. It sort of takes anything up to about forty centimetres in length, and. Uh, uh, it's got a five ton hydraulic uh, ram on it which presses the wood onto a, onto a wedge. Ha! 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 That's made you laugh, hasn't it? Pulled out into lane two and the bus pulled out into lane two in front of you. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so. You take all your logs, you know, all your, your your Swiss rolls, and you put them on this log splitter, and you split them all up. Now I know what you're thinking. You're, <coughs> you're thinking with a <coughs> decent chopping block and a few little round, tiddly logs, you can split them up anyway, and, and that is true, you can. But then eventually, <coughs> what you'll do is you'll come across a, a bifurcation where all the grains all over the place and then there's no way you're going to get an axe through that and there's no way you're going to want to spend an hour sawing through it either so <coughs> all these big old lumps of wood tend to lie around outside holding the tops on dustbins and stuff like that <coughs> that was a bit dangerous LW03 Victor whiskey uniform yeah so uh, so um but with this log splitter, <coughs> what you can do is you can you can put all these big old lumps of wood in there and and crush them all up, you know, and you get a load of really weird irregular lumps of wood. But I mean, a lump of wood is a lump of wood, isn't it? It goes on the fire, doesn't it? it keeps you warm for an hour. And it's quite funny when you're looking at wood when you're outside. You don't really look at wood and think, oh, that's a that's a you know a hundred weight of wood, or that's a ten kilos of wood. You think, oh, that's about, or oh, that'll keep me warm for twenty minutes, or that'll keep me warm for an hour or so. Or there's there's a day's worth of wood, you know, on the fire. That that's one day's worth of keeping the place warm. So I've been, and also at this time of year, I mean, there's not much to do. You can't really mow the grass and that. It's all too wet. It's not much flying going on. Most of the people who are flying now are crashing. So, uh, 
There was an accident at Shoreham yesterday. Don't know why. Someone landed nose down, got seriously injured. I always found that landing nose down is not the best way. So you have to have a, no, my sympathies go out to the, whoever was flying and their family. It is a, it's a dangerous sport flying. Um, I mean, not a lot more so than other dangerous sports, but it's unforgiving, you know, if something goes wrong, then you are likely to either be killed or seriously injured. And everybody who does it knows that. And, um, <clears throat> but you have to, there is a sort of a black humor amongst flyers, you know. We all, uh, we're <laughs> I see us as, uh, we're a bit like that, uh, the eagle has landed. Uh, or was it where eagles dare? I can't remember. The film where Michael Caine is a commander and uh, ends up trying to save someone to put them on a train and gets demoted to um, driving the MTB up and down the British shipping lanes trying to torpedo British ships and every time he goes out on the boat he's got two or three dead bodies to bring back and, and I always think that aviators are a bit like that we've got the sort of the humor of those um, you know the professionalism of that group and and the fatalism of knowing that every year uh, everyone everyone who takes off is not going to be alive <laughs> they land uh, I don't know this year might be me I don't know could be like <clears throat> the lottery. It could be you. <laughs> <coughs> no more videos for you. Well, I shall come back and haunt a few of you. I'll tell you that. So we've got a bloke coming in. First bloke. He's uh, got an idiopathic internal resorption of an upper right one. Well, it's not idiopathic, it's following a blow. And um, we're, we're working today. He's getting married tomorrow. Um, and then uh, we're, he's, he could come in and see us on Thursday and then he's, uh, he's going on holiday for three months on Friday. So that's a challenge, isn't it? Because there's no way we can keep this too. No way we're going to say that. And whatever we do, you know, I mean, <clears throat> this has to be one and done, this treatment, because there's no way I'm going to say to him, no, like, perhaps I'll splint it. And, uh, you know, we'll splint it so well that it'll last you three months. Because if it breaks and he's half, you know, he's up the Bursh al Arab or something in, uh, in Dubai or he's in uh, Hong Kong or somewhere then he's not going to thank me, is he, for having to try and find a, a dentist to sort out an idiopathically, well, uh, an internally resorbed tooth. Difficult surgical extraction of a central incisor, denture construction, etc., in a day, which we are uniquely set up to do, but which, you know, I don't know whether any dent other dentist would necessarily be able to do that. And he, he may be going on a cruise for all I know. So my plan was to uh, do my denture in a day and do the uh, impressions this morning and extract it and fit it this afternoon. And then he's off to his wedding tomorrow with a, with a tub of uh, glue. But um, in fact, I may think it may be more sensible to get him numb this morning, do the impressions, splint the tooth, let him have his wedding, take the tooth out Thursday fit the denture and then pack him off on holiday with a tub of glue and a, and a gum fitted um, and a gum fitted denture then at least he's not going to be uh, he's not going to have a um, bloody great socket is he you know and be coping with a denture for his wedding breakfast and everything uh, let him let him carry on for another two days as normal get the wedding over and done with I think that's why it depends on whether he can come in Thursday. That's sort of if he can't come in Thursday, then we'll have to do it all today. I'm off for two weeks in January 13th to the 27th. So 
So I'm going to say to the girls today, look, bearing in mind that you've just had two weeks off and they're just about to have two weeks off. Um, and this is all on full pay, by the way. We don't ever really deduct any money. If I say I'm having two weeks off, then they have two weeks off on full pay. They like it, I like it, they like it. So, uh, but I might today, I might say tonight between the now and the 13th, I'm going to work like stink. And if you only get half an hour for lunch because of extra patients or, um, you know, we have to book up a, a half day that we normally, you know, where you normally would have got paid but wouldn't work. But we'll have to work it and possibly even Friday afternoon, I don't know. Which will leave me with a higher wage bill. January but at least I'll be you know I'll be going away with perhaps a better cash flow you haven't seen me but oh you have oh you did see me well done right well as usual I'm I'm strolling into work with three minutes to spare so, nice to talk to you. I'll talk to you again. Bye.